Hello, I'm Sandra Gilman, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing with our Board President, Doug Leeds. Welcome to today's program. For a stage performance, you need actors, a play, and an audience. And you need one person whose artistic vision brings it all together, the director. Today we'll meet several directors whose combined work and distinguished credits have entertained theater audiences for years. And we'll be back later to tell you more about the work of the American Theater Wing. But right now, please join us for another edition of Working in the Theater. The play begins with the word of the playwright. The production begins with the director. Hello, I'm Howard Sherman, Executive Director of the American Theatre Wing, and joining us today are three directors whose talents have thrilled audiences across the country. Anne Bogart, Scott Ellis, and Daniel Sullivan. Welcome. To start, I'm wondering if you can each tell me when there was a moment in a production, a sequence in a production, or simply an overall production that you saw where the direction particularly impressed you? There's actually two, because the first one was actually the first professional production I ever saw when I was 15 that actually made me want to be a director. And it was directed by Adrian Hall, and it was the Scottish play. And I remember sitting in the audience, not understanding a word of what I was hearing, because it was Shakespeare. Because so I was brought up on Walt Disney, basically, movies, being a, a Navy kid. and. I had never seen anything like it. There were witches who were coming out of the ceiling and people, three, it was a, a Eugene Lee set. <laughs> and it was uh, witches 360 degrees around, um, uh, action around us. And I was completely disoriented. I didn't understand what was going on. And I said, that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it was directing. And the first lesson in that was, to me, was never speak down to an audience. In other words, I was a 15-year-old kid brought in on school buses with a lot of other 15 and 14-year-olds. And Adrian Hall did not talk down to us. He talked up to us. So that I had to take everything that I'd experienced uh, in my life in those 15 years and bring it up to this place and, 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 and encounter. It was a real encounter with art. But even with no context for having seen theater before, you think it was the direction and not simply the Absolutely play? Absolutely the direction. I mean, certainly the play, it was Shakespeare, but it was the viscerality, the, the um, I, I think the directors actually, in a way, through the actors and through the production, um, ask immediately something particular of any audience. And you know when you see a play that in the first 10 seconds, you know what the director's asking from you. You know how they're asking you to listen, because ultimately the director is doing that in rehearsal, is listening from in a certain way. And I think the way Adrian Hall listened to this amazing company of actors that he had gathered at that time in 1965, thank you very much, you can do your mathematics and figure out how old I am, um, uh, w was something that Im impressed me in the best sense of impress. I, there was an impression upon me. And then quickly, because I, I don't want to dominate this, this first question, but the second and, and enduring inspiration every time I see the work is the work of Ariane Mushkin and the Théâtre du Soleil, a company, not to be confused with the Théâtre, the, the, the theater, what is it? The Cirque du Soleil. Cirque du Soleil, right. <laughs> um, uh, Théâtre du Soleil, a company in Paris. And this is a woman, I think all of us always need a model that you try to live up to. And for, for me, she has been that person. She's a generation older than I am. She started a company, and her work uh, always uh, gives me um, a reason to live another 10 years every time I see it. It's just mm. it's so thrilling and so much in love with the art of the theater. Dan? Um, well, it would be hard to choose between three Peter Brook productions. Mm -hmm. the, the Visit, which I saw when I was in college, uh, Marat Saad, and uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, and maybe the, if you're looking for a moment, <coughs> there was a moment in The Visit, I think, and it was the first time I'd seen uh, a drama that really moved me. And it was the Lunts <coughs> in the visit. Mm -hmm. And um, towards the end of the play, he realizes that he's going, that the town is going to kill him. And uh, Brooke had the men of the town line up uh, in a lane. 
and, the, and uh, Lunt is told that he has to enter the lane. And it took him about a minute to actually walk into it because he knew he was going to his death. Mm -hmm. And he couldn't get his legs to work. <laughs> the, the, the need to go into the lane was there, but he physically couldn't get himself to do it. Uh, it was just a brilliantly uh, directed piece of work. Mm -hmm. And Scott? There are two things, same thing. I, I remember Robert Prosky and Death of a Salesman at Arena when I was a young kid. And I just remember that performance and those moments. And I was like, I had never experienced anything like that, you know, from an actor. So I got, I got, I really was like, okay, I think there's something here that I really want to do. And then jumping ahead, also when I was fairly young, I did, had no rent money. But I took my rent money and went to see, uh, bought tickets to uh, Nicholas Nickleby. Hmm. And I remember looking at that and the whole experience for eight hours and what the director did and that company, it was just eight hours of bliss. I'd never been swept away like that. And that, that I'll never forget. It's interesting to me that though I simply asked for a moment, you're all talking about experiences. Your first instinct is to talk about experiences when you were young. Do you think now that you're working directors, you experience theater differently than you did? You know, occasionally, um, and it actually happened when I saw Corum Boy in London last year. I didn't see the one in New York, but I felt like I was 15 when I was watching it. I actually loved it, and I felt the same thrill. And I think that great theater and great direction, too, which I'll travel anywhere in the world to see, you, you are um, transported to, to uh, uh, both past and future. Um, past in terms of like uh, juice, in terms of life, in terms of energy, and future in terms of optimism. Um, and so in some ways, and I also feel that in terms of directing, as, mu as much as I study and try to be a better director all the time and look at things and read and, and compare and think, somehow at times I think my directing hasn't changed at all from when I was 15 and did my first production, which was The Bald Soprano. and. Uh, that, that the same sense of space and time exists inherently, so I don't actually ever get any better or worse. It's <laughs> the same always, <laughs> oddly enough. Dan, do you think part of your job is to figure out how to thrill people? Well, I think certainly when we were talking about our experiences as younger people, those were transformative moments where uh, we said we were shocked. <laughs> we were shocked at what the, uh, an experience like that could be. And I think, yeah, we somehow chased that a little bit, I think, as directors. I think it's harder for us to, to, to be transformed now, uh, particularly because we look at things uh, somewhat technically. And we study a thing. Uh, um, and I think when we're most bowled over, I don't know if this is true, you folks, but it's when I, when I, I forget about the direction. Now <laughs> when I, when I just pulled into yeah. it. That's, that Definitely. doesn't happen Do you that find often. that you do that in, with your own work sometimes, too? I, I just know sometimes, very few times, right. and I'll just go, oh, I'm very relaxed here. I'm not even thinking I directed this, and I'm thinking, yeah, absolutely. I think that's working, that's absolutely. good. And most of the time, I don't feel that at yeah, all. So, but uh -huh. there are right. moments, and I think that's, yeah. you're right, there's yeah. that feeling of just sitting yeah. back and just gone. Yeah. Yeah. But again, the question is now is, do you try to thrill others in the work that you do? Oh, oh, you can, uh, I mean, I'm speaking for myself and I wonder what you two think. You can only thrill yourself. In other words, if you start second guessing and saying, well, this thrills me, but is it gonna thrill Mr. and Mrs. McGillicuddy, you're lost. And, and I think being a director, you have to have simultaneously a huge ego and no ego. So the huge ego is the audacity to say that what delights me and tickles me will delight other people. And if I lose touch with that delight, then I am lost. And if I'm doing, making decisions for the wrong reasons, which is second guessing what either a producer or even a playwright or a, an audience is gonna think, I'm, I'm, I've lost my way. Or God forbid a critic. Or yeah. God forbid <laughs> a critic. I mean, do you guys feel that way as oh, well? Absolutely. 100%, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I fall, Sometimes I will fall into that trap, as, yeah. and then I'll stop myself and go, stop, you know, back up, and you can only trust yourself and the people you're working with in that yeah. room, and that's it, and the rest of it, I, I always say I have no control over it, so that At I the same time, control. you do have to listen. It's not to say that you don't listen to an audience. You say with an audience? 
Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. because, because absolutely, and that's painful, don't you find? that when you actually have a first audience, that you, it's not like, you actually have to start listening to the audience. I can never look in an audience, but listen, and it's painful and necessary yeah. in that sense, because they breathe in a certain That's way. That's right, exactly. They tell you. Yeah. You listen to audiences, the collaborators that you have on productions, do you listen to them? Did they talk to you about what they think your work is? Say the designers, certainly the playwrights, how, what's that communication? Well, I talk to uh, designers bef usually before my work in the rehearsal hall happens and discussions about the play don't happen that much once you get into the rehearsal process. Unfortunately, in this country, the rehearsals are relatively brief and there's very little feedback that can happen until you get into the tech and you realize what mistakes you've made. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that there's not a lot of, that's at least that's my experience. It, it may be different with Anne, but the, uh, um, you know, it, there's not, a, the, the collaboration is almost entirely with actors during the rehearsal. With, with my company, I have a company, city company, SITI, not to be confused with CITY, SITI, um, we actually have designers in the room in rehearsal, mm -hmm. which is a real luxury, but it turns out it's not a luxury because the conversation that continues is unusual and very fecund, very fruitful. Mm -hmm. Are they in the room, and have, has the design already been done, or the, that design is this, being created as well, you're rehearsing? Well, we come up with a design clearly that has a floor plan, but right. it, it's adjusted and during then it rehearsal. And it adjusts during yeah. rehearsal. Yeah. Which is, I know, unusual and luxurious, but for, for me, necessary. Yeah. I mean, you certainly try to come up with a design that is adjustable, that isn't a f fascistic decision mm -hmm. about how this play should be. You're inevitably working, in most cases, with a producer, whether that's a commercial producer or an artistic director at a not-for-profit. What's, what's their role in your process? I think a good producer it, uh, hopefully, is someone that you would listen to. They're not. They're not. There are a lot of not good producers. But if you're lucky to have a good producer, whether it's someone who's running a theater or a commercial producer who comes in, a if it's commercial theater, you have to listen. You have to sit down and talk with them because they're the ones that are paying for the for the show and for you. So there has to be a, a give and take with that. And if it's a uh, you know, like the Roundabout or many of the other theaters around, I think the artistic director slash producer is someone that you do want to have, uh, uh, you know, a conversation with. So I, I sort of welcome it, uh, you know, to a point. And then you're always going to get to a point of saying, okay, but this is what I believe or this is, I hear you listening to those people and then deciding, okay, yes or no, you know. So I, I, I think they're important. I mean, mm -hmm. as far as important in the sense that we have to, we, you have to deal with that. And Dan, you've been an artistic director, certainly. You're the acting artistic director at Manhattan Theater Club mm -hmm. this season. So you, you shift chairs. Yes. Does that give you a different perspective on how to communicate to directors when you're the artistic director versus when you're the person who has is, is been brought in to do a production by know. someone? I don't know. I mean, I, I, f I feel uh, as a director, the, the, the producing director or the the or simply the producer uh, talking to you about the play is it, directing is a relatively lonely profession there are a lot of people who talk to you about it uh, uh, so uh, getting another opinion I think uh, particularly if it's a smart one is uh, um, something I look forward to uh, it and even getting the wrong opinion can help you sort of solidify your own opinions. Uh, 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 a challenge is a good thing, I think, uh, um, particularly to towards the end when you, when you can actually see a whole thing and, and make decisions about it. You know? mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of feedback from anybody when I'm directing uh, early on because it, it's just confusing. Mm -hmm. But there is that dreaded moment when people start showing up with yellow pads to talk to you. <laughs> yes, all right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you all, when you begin a production, do you go into it with a concept? We often hear about directorial concept, or is that something that is found during the development of the production? When I'm doing work, it's really about the words and about those actors and finding moment to moment and the truth within the piece. So I don't tend to come in with a huge concept, usually, other than having 
discussed with the designers how we're going to tell this story. So for me, it's, a, it's really about getting in and doing that work with the actors and the playwright, if you're l working with a live playwright. Uh, and it, it is, it's that, in that work in that room. So uh, you, know, you have to have an understanding of the, of the play and what you want to do, and like I said, design-wise. But then for me, it's really just about that work with the actors and the words wow. in that room. Concept is a is a not a friendly word these days, mm. and for good reasons. I, I think my job is to imagine a world in which the play might exist, and then I uh, upload that idea to the designers and certainly to the actors. I describe everything that I can possibly imagine in a description of what the language of this world is, what its logic is, what it feels like, what it smells like, and then I expect to receive back from the designers and the actors not an agreement with my world, but uh, a conversation, so that a world starts to actually develop. Um, and this, this is, is the world in which the play lives design-wise. And also, I think that every time I approach a play, there has to be something that, and it, it, it will, I won't do the play unless this happens. It's an alchemical something that happens in me that makes me have a hunch or maybe a, 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 a leap, something that I'm even afraid to say to the actors or designers because I think it's really dumb, but an idea that maybe it might be X, that everybody looks at me like I'm a little crazy, and then it turns out that that without the leap, and, and it's true in any creative work, that without some sort of leap, nothing happens. An actor knows that, that, that every scene they do needs some kind of leap involved or else nothing is engendered. But there has to be some hunch that then can be proven wrong. But you put something out, and my job is to start a snowball in motion so that other people can add to it or, 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 or put obstacles in front of it or challenge it or change it. Ultimately, ideas, which a lot of people glom onto, are cheap. You know, you can find ideas every time you open a magazine, there's 150 ideas about anything. So you choose a few, but then the, then the, the, the terminology I like to use in rehearsal is, what is it? What is it really? In other words, I'll say, this is what it is. But then if you don't say then, but what is it really? Then there's no there there, as Gertrude Stein said about Oakland, California. There's nothing that actually is engendered. So it's, you certainly have to propose ideas, a world, even a concept. But that's cheap. That's not what you're in the room for. So if it becomes about fulfilling that idea, then, then um, that's really not interesting, but as a, as a launching pad, I think you do need uh, 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 something to communicate. Thanks. How much of that happens in, in rehearsals for you in terms of, because, uh, because you, you do work uh, um, in a different way with designers in the room, uh, uh, so d does, the, does the idea or the no, ideas, I, do, they, do they evolve during a rehearsal? They period? certainly evolve, but I spend a great deal of time first just in the um, pressure cooker of my own imagination and, and, uh, and, and, and digressions, you mm -hmm. know, s sleeping sometimes or, or, or napping th while I'm researching something will lead in directions. And I, if I haven't done that work, I haven't earned, earned the right to walk in the room. I can't just go walk into a room and say, let's collaborate. Yeah, sure. I mean, my work is exceedingly collaborative, and I mm -hmm. use everybody in the room, and I am interested in all their opinions all the time, and I have a makeup in me that doesn't mind that. You know, I like to hear too many opinions, because ultimately, if I get really mad, I know they're right. And mm -hmm. if I don't feel anything, I know they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of think of my body as a barometer. And if I get upset, then I know I have to listen to whoever just said something. Right. That's so good. it's really yeah. annoying, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but if I haven't spent that time of sort of deep study and research, then I have not done my job. And mm -hmm. I, I, I don't have the right to actually start. So That collaboration, yeah. yeah. Dan, there was an article in which you talked about a conversation with a director who wanted to know how you were approaching a show, and you said, I just go in and start working. And you said the director seemed disappointed because he wanted to know what you were going to do to it. Mm. Uh, right. And you commented that sometimes when you go into production, you have something, I believe you actually used the word perverted in mind. <laughs> And I'm just; those seem to me to be very different approaches. So, so first. Well, I Dan. think that you know, go back to what Anne was saying when she said the, the idea of 
uh, concept, uh, that, that word is, is a kind of a facile word, I think. And uh, you know, that's what I was talking about in, in terms of what you do to uh, the play. Uh, um, it's, it's like wreaking a violence upon a play. Mm -hmm. And I don't particularly like, I, I, I want to understand and completely respect the text and work from there. I don't want to impose to begin with. I want the text to tell me what to do as opposed to me telling the text what it is. Uh, so that's the way I approach a, a play, any play. I think the idea, well, I think we all respond to, we shiver at the word concept, mm -hmm. is there's a way of approaching a play that if you, if you decide what it is before you do it, then you have made the play smaller than you. Mm -hmm. And you actually want the play to be bigger than anything you can imagine. I'm, I'm sure yeah. we agree on yeah. that. And Absolutely. the minute you say, it happens inside of this parameter, you know, it's, um, uh, it's reducing so that the audience is guessing doing a guessing game rather than encountering a play in its, in its largesse. Mm -hmm. And it sh you should approach a play, I think, as a canvas that's much bigger than you, not something that you can control. It's right? funny, I always th think of it as, it's just removing those blinders. You have that, yeah. that sense, and then you gotta, you gotta remove that because there's all this other stuff over here. And right. Sometimes you think, oh, no, I know that, and I feel comfortable because I'm going in with that confidence, but the fact is, it, it's, it's not gonna help you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've gotta go in lose it and see what else is happening. It's the difference between I want to understand this and I want to fix this. <laughs> How do you foster collaboration when you're working on a show? Again, with your creative team, with your actors, are there things that you have to do to foster good collaboration? I mean, I think with, with your, I think collaboration is the most important thing, bar none, that's it, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think from a director's point of view uh, is is creating that atmosphere in a rehearsal room where where there's a, where there's safety where it's safe to fall where it's safe to ask questions where it's I always say hey listen I, I don't know this for for a fact here I'm just thinking maybe this let's try this if it doesn't work we're going to try something else so I think the setting up that environment uh, and I always, I, for me, it's got to be a joyful environment. I don't care what type, what show you play, you're working on. It's got to be joyful in the sense of of the exploration and the collaboration. And you, I think it's the director's job to create that atmosphere to be able to do that. So absolutely, collaboration is for me the most important thing. And it starts with the design team when you first sit, or the playwright when you're sitting down. But absolutely, most important. Uh, to evoke Jerzy Grotowski's uh, language, he. Uses, used, he's dead now, used the words active culture and passive culture. And his um, interest in theater and why he eventually left the theater and didn't believe in audiences, which is very sad, is that he felt that they were passive cultures, audiences. But I also think there's such a thing as an active culture and a passive culture in rehearsal. And to give the most extreme example um, is in opera. When you direct opera, mm. uh, th 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 it, it, that kind of place engenders a passive culture where you come in and there's a chorus, a huge chorus, and they're basically waiting, they hate directors, and they're basically waiting to, uh, to be told what to do and to be abused. So you come into this <laughs> culture and they already hate you, right? This is an extreme example of what a rehearsal might be, but I'm just using that. And I found, and I love working in opera because you come into this environment where everybody expects to be told what to do, and then uh, I like to go over to a chorus member and say, would it be funnier if you guys tip the, t uh, tip the chairs on bar 62 or 79? And they look at you, but, <laughs> well, you're the director, you should tell us. And I said, but you, you know you know music better than I, would it be funnier to, on bar, <laughs> this bar or this bar? They, they look at you and they say, well, um, it'd be funnier if you do it on bar 96. <laughs> and you say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, would you tip your chairs on bar 96? After a while, they start getting excited, like, um, Miss Bogart, um, <laughs> we of the chorus think that we should actually yeah. tip, we, you know, we think we should all move on this, on this measure. Right, whatever. Yeah. And suddenly, the room changes, and everybody's excited, and as you say, that word joyful is something that is, is not ironic at all. It's, 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 a, it's, um, it's a very true thing, and I really relate to that. 
But to create an atmosphere in a room where everybody feels heard means you have to listen. And when you say, what do you do? You set up an environment where actually people feel heard. And, 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 it, and that's something you can't actually fake, real listening. And I think that is the, I think if there's two parts of the recipe for collaboration, one is to listen and the other is to respect. Seriously respect the people who are in the room with you. Not pretend to, but find a way that you actually respect them. I, mean, I agree with everything being said, uh, that it's, it's uh, trust is, is everything, I think, in a, in a rehearsal room. And I think sometimes uh, actors with me um, get a little worried because they realize uh, af by the second week that it's sort of mostly on them <laughs> that, that uh, you create chemistries uh, that are healthy, you create connections between characters and with, between actors. And when you get up and start working, uh, pretty much the impulses th that you're using as a director are the impulses of the actors as opposed to your own impulses. And th for a while, that takes a little getting used to uh, uh, because there is that element of being wanting wanting to be told what to do. Uh, but in fact, ownership of, of their performances is uh, absolutely important. Uh, the, the performance belong to the actor. It, it's interesting, and we're saying that the, the listening, I, I say, well, I'd be like crazy if I didn't listen to, to an actor, mm -hmm. you know, a, an opinion or a feeling. And, and maybe we'll talk about it later, but casting, I, I, my thing is 75% of the job that's that important. So you hopefully have put in a group of actors that you trust and that you know and that are good and that you're gonna be a collaborate with, but to not listen to them or not to have them part of the, the collaboration would, I think would be ridiculous, would be foolish. In listening to the approach in the rehearsal room, I can't help but wonder, can directing be taught or is directing something that is simply learned? I actually think the only way that a director can learn to direct is by directing. I actually think that assisting is death to a director because they are basically wasting their time comparing their impulses. You might disagree with me. And it's true, I, I, after I've said this many times, I've also thought that two of the best assistants I ever had are also incredible directors, um, Tina Landau and uh, Diane Paulus. They, they went on to direct. They went, yeah, yes. they, they were amazing assistants. Yeah. And so that's not always true that it's death. but. Um, in, in, in the program that I run uh, at Columbia, in the first year, the six directors have to direct two fully staged productions under 30 minutes a week. Yes, a week. They have to find actors in New York, uh, conceive of a production, two of them, off book, designed everything per week. So by the third week, the directors don't know who they are anymore. They've used up all their tricks, they're completely exhausted, <laughs> and th they're confused, and they still have to keep going because they have to show two more pieces that week. Um, in the second year, they have a, a whole semester to do two plays, and then the third mm -hmm. year, they do a thesis production. The idea being that um, the only thing you have as a director is your intuition. So you actually have to break down all of the, your resistances to that intuition. So it's a little bit like boot camp, I would say, uh, to get in touch with how you work genuinely in the moment, in, in rehearsal. Yeah. So I don't think you can teach it, but you can create a, a place where people have to do it enough that they finally learn something. Now, Dan and Scott, you both came out of acting and from that first experience at Trinity Rep just went right on that directing track. But, so how did you become directors? Uh, I was an actor, and I was in a, a show called The Rink, Andrew and Epps of The Rink, and I approached John and Fred about directing uh, a show, Floor of the Red Menace, their first show, and they literally looked at me and said, have you ever directed? And I went, no. And they said, okay, we'll give it a try. And it was something that I'd wanted to do. So I have had no training exp experience. I do feel my work as an actor and the training I got as an actor was immensely helpful to go in as a director because I do, under, no matter what, I understand how to talk with an actor because I've been on the other side. So once you've been there, I think you have a, a at least, uh, you know, a language. And Dan, you, you teach, but you did start as an actor? As a director, I won't say anything to an actor that I wouldn't want said to myself as an actor. Hmm. And I, I didn't like a lot of things said to me as an actor, so I'm, I'm fairly um, 
um, concise. Um, but I do think that um, assisting, I think, is actually a good thing. Um, not necessarily, you don't necessarily learn directing from watching another director direct, but you do, uh, you do manage to uh, learn about making relationships, about how you relate to actors, and virtually all the other elements of directing. And I think that's important. As a matter of fact, you form relationships as, a, as an assistant uh, that, that can be very, very healthy. We also, the idea of we we're talking about just being in a room and directing in a room, but the reality is it gives everyone, an, the assistants, an opportunity to see it's also a much larger picture that you have to deal with, mm -hmm. whether it's an artistic yeah. director or a producer or the designers or what, and it's learning that whole process and not just about what goes on in a room, which truthfully it's going to be different for every director. All three of us probably work differently in some ways, but also alike, hopefully. But I also think that, you know, we, when you were talking earlier about this idea that you carry with you and at a certain point you may say it, you don't, that's about timing and that's mm. one thing I think that yeah. you can learn as Absolutely. an assistant is that very often I can tell assistants are looking at me like, why don't you say something? <laughs> you know, that's not working, you should say something. Uh, but you know that this is not the time to say Absolutely. that and that that actor has to explore until such time as they will discover that for themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but that's a very difficult thing to teach. You just have to sort of see it in action and, and then understand why. And also actors, all actors are different so you're, you're sort of figuring out how that actor is working. Sometimes that's they're right. okay to get it a little earlier but sometimes you think no that that actor, you've got to you know, lay back on it, so right. it's going to be that. Right. That's a, a terrific right. point, you're right. Mm -hmm. right. Scott, you touched on something very interesting, which is that there's more to directing than just what happens in the room. How much of the director's job is artistic? How much of the director's job is logistical? Uh, coordinating lots of different elements and how it's all brought together. Are they separate skills? Are there people who are great in the room, but putting together the whole production can be tough? I to absolutely. I think there, there are some people who are great about doing that in the meetings and getting everything set and then get in a room and they don't know how to talk to an actor or they don't know how to, to run that. And just the opposite where it's like that they're safe there but outside it's like whoa not, not quite as organized with it. So I do think there's a balance. Unless you're smart enough to say hey I'm not good at the organizing I'm gonna get myself a great assistant and they're gonna really help focus all this. My strength is in the room but ho hopefully you know you can find the balance to, to learn that. But they're both important. They're both very important. What, what you're doing up to that point before you walk into that rehearsal room is you know you've made some major decisions that is are go is going to affect you know this process you know so that I do think that becomes just as important of, of juggling all the balls you know there, there's a theory I heard I don't know where it came from but I think it's very true is that each of us is either a good beginner a good middle or a good mm. ender <laughs> like I'm a really good beginner I love the research and then I love talking about it I love getting it into motion but when it comes around to tech I, I'm like thinking about another project Wow! you know and, I'm, mm. and there are other people I mentioned Tina Landau earlier who's a director I think is fantastic she's a lousy beginner she's a great ender I mean she's fantastic in in previews mm -hmm. and we'll keep fixing and fixing where I've completely lost interest. So the trick is, <laughs> going back to Scott's point, is to find people you work with, whether they're managers or whoever, or actors or whoever, who actually do what you don't do so well. You know, because there, there's, you never can do all of it anyway. Absolutely. You can't be a great organizer and a great presence in rehearsal and a great PR, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So I tend to work with actors who are really good enders. They, they get obsessive at the end and they keep working when I've lost interest and I'm really thinking about another play and I find it's my job to think about another play and with work at the company they know mm. that they know that I'm supposed to be thinking two shows ahead of time in a way right. so I'll walk into tech with books on another play and they're going Anne pay <laughs> attention <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you a good, good beginner good ender what, what, what are you two so I love the research I love I love all that uh, but I have to, I'm jumping, the, I'm, I'm, yeah, so I think I'm good at all of it. No, I don't. <laughs> I think I'm okay at all of it. Uh, but see, I love the tech. That to me, I can't wait to get into, I mean, I love the rehearsal process too. I love yeah. that, you know, but I love when it, when you start putting it all together. That to me is, is, is sort of 
thrilling, and it's hard for me to pull away from that and to leave that process because that that to me is is where I that's I get excited about that. So you know, I, I actually heard a story about Dan from somebody I won't tell you who, but who who said that you will say to an actor in previews, "Don't let him laugh here. Don't let him laugh here. You'll get a bit of a laugh here." Yeah. I so admire that. <laughs> I think about it all the time. See, you're in my mind, all the time. and I wish I could do that. You know, I I was last night in the theater. We had a, a dress rehearsal, and I was watching, and I was I was thinking, I wish I could do that. I wish I could know. Don't let the audience laugh here. Don't let them laugh right. here. You get a right. bigger one here. Do, yeah. do you know what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, I do. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, yeah. I don't know where you get that ability, but I wish I had it. I don't. I don't know. That, uh, but that, I think that's just sort of a, uh, a comic instinct more than anything else. <laughs> it's a, you know, it's it's just a, it's probably cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap. <laughs> no, I, was, I, I was Great vaudeville is built on that. You know, I mean, you, really. It's you're not working cheap with at all. with Mary Louise Parker now, and I once said to her. In a rehearsal, I said, "I think there's a moment here." And she said, "Oh, I hate moments." Just, just the imposition of like a technical idea right. uh, uh, was going to interrupt, or to think the of it as a moment, of whatever, you know, the moment. And she was actually right about that. Uh -huh. in, in that, at that, at that moment in the play, uh, that to try to make a moment was going to actually kill the ongoing life of the scene. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering if your process is different when you're working with a long established playwright or if you're working with someone who's fairly new. Do you have to approach your job differently? Well, I think probably is it's a, a totally different I think it's a totally different experience than working on a new play than it is working on a, a revival of a play that's already there. It's working mm -hmm. unless there's the idea of we're going to go in and change the revival, you know. It's a vi I think it's a very different experience. Whether the playwright is alive or is no longer with us, if the play has already been done, I think it's a, a, a different way of working. I think there's just a, uh, for me, there's been sort of, you know what, it works. I've got to make sure now I can get it to work again. But with a new play, you have no, you don't know what you have. You know, you so the, the working with that playwright and the changes, you know, is, is, is pretty major. I, I found, you know, so I think that's there's there's just different different experiences. But also, is it different when the playwright themselves hasn't had many collaborative experiences versus somebody who's who's been in the business a while? You're working oh. with a relatively young playwright, yes. Roberto Aguirre Sacasa, yeah. a few months. Sarah Rule, of course, has had great success, but still earlier in her career. Is it different, or do you accord them the exact same process that you would if you're working with somebody who's who's been in it for 20 or 30 years? Um. I, I have found, well, it, it's different for every every writer. You, Roberto so far has been remarkable, you know. Douglas Cartabino, though he had done stuff more than Roberto has, I, I think the process has w was was great and, and, you know, was able to change and, and move. I Honestly, I just think it's it's individually, at least I've had the experience, is everyone is, is different so that, the, the collaboration is, is, is a little different. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a matter of, of how old or old young or, or old yeah. they are. I mean, I think Sarah is obsessed with every detail, with the color of a dress, you know, with every, uh, and she's constantly rewriting and she watches very closely and listens closely, as opposed to Chuck Me. Granted, he's much older, but I think he was the same way when he was young. When I work with him, he lets me do anything and wants to be surprised and wants to see things he never dreamt of. But I don't think it's a matter of age. I think it's proclivity and their, their nature, I think, as playwrights. So the issue of a revival of a work versus a new play, then how much of your process is dealing with the fact that you now have a fixed script, you can't just go back to the playwright and say, let's change this, versus something where you can have a, an effect on the script. Obviously, working on a Pinter play like The Homecoming, mm -hmm. that's a long established script. Do you right. have to approach it differently, or is it essentially the same? For me, it's the same. Uh, it, it's all new to me, <laughs> you know. So whether it's an old, whether it's an old play or a new play, it doesn't. Uh, and I, you know, it's not a matter of going to a playwright and asking them to fix something. Certainly, mm -hmm. you know, certainly that occasionally happens. But that's not the motor uh, uh, when you're doing a new play. You're you're doing the play, uh, um, and occasionally there'll be a glitch. Uh, but I, I approach every play the same way. 
Uh, but yeah. with, with, because you've done so many new and, and revivals also, I mean, would you say that the process is different in the sense that you, you're putting up a new play and all of a sudden, you know, once you get it up, something's not working yet, or there's a scene that yes, has, is not, so oh, you've absolutely. got to rewrite it. Absolutely. Where with the homecoming, I totally, you're absolutely right, it's all new to us, no matter what we're doing, right. but the play works, so we're not, right. the second act doesn't have to be re-looked right. at. And uh, in some cases, you're asking yourself, why did it work? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. uh, or in some cases, you're either measuring yourself or being measured against some uh, production, some benchmark production of that play also, uh, <laughs> that you're either sort of chafing against or, or uh, trying to change the, the nature of this, of this particular production as, uh, as it compares to some other production. That's not necessarily a healthy way to work, but that does happen. I have a, a slightly different approach to cl more, especially classic work. Mm -hmm. Or, I, I and I think it's because I'm interested in sociology and and history a lot. Is I think the plays, the more baggage a play brings with them, in a way, more the more interesting that baggage is to me. In other words, what does an actor who's playing Stanley Kowalski do with Marlon Brando? You know, because an audience brings with them mm -hmm. certain expectations. So I like it's almost, and this is not. I'm not suggesting this is a way to work, but I naturally gravitate towards finding out all of the baggage that a play brings with it. All of the productions that have ever been done, I like to research. I like to find out what was the original energy that was released when the play was done in the first time. So that, that doing a play is not about reconstructing the look of the first time it was done, but trying to tap into the energy that once that, that, that was released in the world when this play happened and it was successful because it's still being done to this day. Mm -hmm. So somehow what I try to do is ingest all that information. I would if I could, I would see every production that has ever been done which is the opposite of my friend Robert Woodruff, the amazing American director who, who doesn't want to know anything. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't want to know anything about any previous production. And if he's, if a play is being done that he thinks he might do in the future, he won't go see it. Wow. I have the opposite proclivity. I want to know everything. And then after I've ingested it all, I follow the notion that Marshall McLuhan stole from IBM, which is information overload equals pattern recognition. You know, that you fill yourself with information and then something comes out, a, 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 way, of, a way of relating to the play, which I find helpful for me anyway. So hmm. I'm interested in the That's baggage it comes with. I got lucky, I was just working with David Rabe on streamers, a production that, you know, he had said no to for 30 years. And finally, yeah. I just, after six years, I kept hounding him and saying, please, please, please let me do it. So I went up to Boston. But so, so the same thing, I took, I just did all the research, everything yeah. I could do to fill that in. But I also was lucky to have David there, who then seeing it and looking at it, started making some changes himself. I didn't ask, but right. he sort of said, I, sort of the same thing, what, what made this at that time spark now things have changed a little bit how can I you know tweak this so it was sort of mm. a fascinating experience mm. because it wasn't I didn't expect that but it, it did it yeah I always find you know I admire directors who can actually say to a, a playwright you know you got a problem in the second act you know I can't do that I tend to think of the playwright no matter how young or old they are as God and that what I've received is perfect and then the playwright will see me struggling with it and then they'll do rewrites. But I, I, can't, I find it difficult to say, I'm having a problem here. I want them to experience my problem hmm. and for them to figure it out. I don't have the problem, but I'm very nice. <laughs> I'm very nice, but I go, I don't think this is working. Yeah. This is, I think there's something, here. we gotta look at this. It doesn't seem, I could be wrong, but right now I don't think this is working. But You I, have that kind of mind. I, I just don't. Yeah, you no, know, I, and I, and I, I love that. I mean, I, I think writers are God too, so I go in, I love to think it's perfect and that's it. I, well. I think that maybe I'll try that next. <laughs> no, no, it. stick to your, it's working, whatever you're doing. <laughs> now, Scott, you just mentioned uh, pursuing David Rabe in order oh, to do a production yeah. of, of Streamers. Yes. I'm very curious as to whether there are plays that you are all aware of that you think, I shouldn't do this or couldn't do this. Are there plays that you're either afraid of or think just are not your style? I, you know, read about 10 plays a week. Hmm. And uh, I would say, you know, usually there's one of those 10 that you admire. Uh, um, but you don't very often want to do it <laughs> uh, uh, for one reason or another, whether it's not wanting to spend a couple of months with it. 
<laughs> where you think, I would love to see this play, but I don't really think I want to sit around with it for, for two months. Uh, and all of that is just purely in, instinctive. I don't think there, I could never tell you exactly why, uh, but you just have a hunch that you're not going to really want to spend time with these people. Uh, um, uh, so, I, but I wouldn't actually say that there are plays that I'm necessarily frightened of. Plays that I'm frightened of really attract me. I, I'm frightened of the homecoming. Uh, I'm still frightened of it when I go to see it. Uh, um, but that was one of the reasons that I wanted to pursue it, is to, is to both sort of discover and preserve its mysteries. I worked as a butcher all my life. The chopper and the slab. You know what I mean, the slab? The chopper and the slab? To keep my family in luxury. Well, my, my mother was bedridden, my brothers were all invalids. I had to make money for the leading psychiatrist. I mean, I had to read books. I had to be prepared for an emergency at every stage. Crippled family, three bastard sons, slut bitch of a wife, don't talk to me about the pain of job, but I've suffered the pain, I've still got the pains. When I give a cough, my back collapses, and now I've got a lazy idle bugger of a brother who won't get to work on time. First of all, I have to go home and start reading plays immediately. <laughs> oh my God, 10 plays. Like, I know. Oh, well, I can yeah. barely get up. But I'm sort of interested, because I've done this a few times, which is I, I go and I look and I go, you know what, I don't know and I'm not even sure if I'm right for this, but I'm being asked to do this or I'm, I want to push myself, even though in my gut there's a little part of me that says, I don't think I'm right for it, but you know what, I want to try to just push a little bit. Do you mm -hmm. do that? Do you try to do that a lot, or uh, when you say if you, when you say push push yourself say, into you an area that you're gonna, not certain yeah, about? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go do that. Uh, perfect example. I'll be, you know, when Alec Baldwin approached me to do do Sloan, it wasn't something that I was like, really? I never. I mean, I like right. I like Orton a lot, but it wasn't right. something that I I thought, yeah, that's my. But you know what? I thought he wanted me to do it. He saw something, and I thought this is a good op op opportunity for me to just get in there and explore right. a different writer and a different language and, and different. So, right. you know, and, and probably five years ago I would have said no. Now I go, sure. you know what, go, jump. Yeah. You know, yeah. if it works, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't, yeah. you're gonna learn something, right. you know, so. Yeah. Do you do that? Do you? Oh, or? yeah. Well, first of all, I also, I'm in awe of you for reading 10 plays a week. Yeah. I mean, but, I, I, but that's yeah, because so. I'm doing this Manhattan Theater Club job now, so it's really, yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah. and plus the fact, I don't finish all of the plays. <laughs> <laughs> I could get maybe 30 pages in and you think like, okay, that's enough. Could you still do that, Ant? Not even, I can't even do that. Well, so. I find plays are the hardest, and I love reading. Yeah. I find plays are the hardest reading to do, and I read them very slowly, and they're an investment of Im imagination, and I hate reading them, and I hate saying it, and I feel guilty <laughs> because I so love playwrights, and I know how painful it is for them to say, give me a play and wait the time it takes me to read it while I'm reading six other biographies. I mean, it's... It's painful, but if a play, most plays I can't do because I understand them too quickly. Mm. I, I'm interested in doing plays that I really can't, can't, don't understand, and maybe that's a leftover from first seeing Adrian Hall's production of the Scottish play I mentioned earlier, is that if I understand it and I feel I can, can do it, there's no real reason to do it. So often mm. it'll also be people who say, Anne, you should do this that'll make me do it. Mm -hmm. People who I admire, who, mm -hmm. who, who I think are smart, and they say, you really should do this. And sometimes I, guilty as charged, I don't even finish reading the play and I'll say, I'll do this because <laughs> it intimidates me and I can't quite get through it. Um, and that's reason enough to do it. But most plays I can't do, I cannot do. Mm -hmm. See, I have the opposite response. If somebody tells me I should do a play, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do <laughs> You don't want to do it? No. I think you do it. It's certain. <laughs> There's something in there. No, you want me to fall? It's you want, certain we're, we're people this. who tell me. I mean, certain yeah, people who I admire. People that you admire. Say, they say, Anne, you really should do this. Yeah. I, I trust them. Yeah. You know, do you? I'm sorry, I'm just gonna. I, I just always wanted to ask this too with other directors. Do you have other directors that you trust and that come in? I always find the directors are sort of. We're all in our sort of separate little places, and I always think that's so odd. There's so many, two being right here that I have such respect for. Do you have? Other directors, or is that, do you not go into that? Does that get murky, having directors, you know, come in, or a friend who is a director? I, I, yeah, I have uh, directors who are friends who occasionally I'll ask to say, come, is this okay? Is this okay? Come, come take a look at this. Yeah. Is, this a, is this all right? This, this makes sense? But that, that's, uh, 
I, I think that's a good and healthy thing. I think it's yeah. great. You I, know, I, uh, on, a, on a different uh, response to your question, I think that maybe we'll relate to it. It might be interesting for other people to hear, but I remember one night I was coming from rehearsal. I was invited. Joanne Acolytis, who's a great cook and a wonderful director, was cooking dinner for other people. And Robert Woodruff was there, and Michael Greif was there for dinner. She'd made this dinner, and she said, come for mm -hmm. dinner. And I said, I have to arrive late because I'm coming from rehearsal. So I arrived, and they had been there. They'd had dr drunk some wine or whatever. And when I walked in, they said, Anne! You just came from rehearsal. <laughs> you must need a drink here. You want some food? And I, I was so happy, and I thought we never get this. We, yes, right. Directors yes, right. don't get this, and we had. Mm. It was. I thought. Or other this directors, is, people who really understand where, what. Uh, other director, because nobody ever understands. Yeah. You've come from rehearsal, <laughs> and they knew exactly, exactly what I was feeling, and I realized That's how great. rare that is yeah. that yes. directors yes. actually have that yeah. Uh, yeah. that warmth and commiseration because yeah. we are so isolated yeah. from each other, yeah. and I'm always jealous of the actors who go off to the bar and commiserate and kvetch and whatever they do. Yeah. Right. And, I don't want uh, you around anymore. But you don't really want to go with them, do you? <laughs> no. No, you don't. No. Although there's another, <laughs> there's, there's another in, the, in, in, in the spirit of theories, there's another theory about each of us of directors have different primary relationships. I once asked Lisa Peterson, I said, who do you have crushes on? <laughs> Actors, playwrights, designers? She said, oh, the playwrights. I said, who do you want to go out with afterwards? She said, oh, the playwrights. I said, that's interesting. I always get crushes on the actors, actors. and I want to go out with them. Some directors get crushes on the designers. They just want to hang out with the designers yes, all the time. Right. Right. I put it to you. Yeah. Who well, do you get crushes on? Oh, I have no, I, no anybody. Anybody yeah. show. No, I have no. I just <laughs> want to go home. <laughs> Stan just <laughs> wants to go home. I'll be on slips. But I have no bear. Is the process exhilarating? Is the process tough for you at the end of the day? But doesn't it depend on the day? I mean, there's days no. I'm so full of energy. I remember one day, two weeks ago, I came home and I literally fell onto the bed. I was so <laughs> drained and exhausted and it was not a good day. Yeah. But on good days, you, you're, I, I don't think there's a general answer to Agreed. that. Right? I think you have some really great days where you just fly home and can't wait to get back in the room and others you just go, uh, that was such a horrible day, and they're going to find out I don't know what I'm doing, yeah. and so I don't want to leave yeah. again. I find the only thing that's changed with age is that I'm pretty much able now to turn it off. Oh. That is, I don't really you. continue thinking about it much. I, mm -hmm. I start again really? the next day. You it's really sort of, it's like a union head, <laughs> you know, or something, where it's like <laughs> my eight hours are over, and Done. I'm not thinking about it anymore. I think that's healthy. I think it's yeah. really healthy, yeah. really yeah. healthy. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try that while I'm reading. Me too. The, while I'm reading the ten plays, I have to go <laughs> home and read. Do you each have a pet project you've long dreamed of doing, and the opportunity has never come your way? And you're nodding. Oh, sure. I mean, you brought up the visit. I mm -hmm. wanted to do the visit in all its glory for a long time, but it's too expensive. I mean, and, and then once we once I did get uh, uh, there was a theater that offered to do it, but then the rights out for the musical were out, and I mean, it's the visit is the play I want to do. It's. Mm -hmm. more than anything. Well, I have to say, Streamers was something I've been wanting to do for a long time, so I'm fortunate to do it. I, I got really lucky. I, uh, Cicely Berry, do you know Cicely Berry? Mm -hmm. uh, she's just a wonderful teacher. Uh, came over from London and worked with American directors on Shakespeare, and I just fell in love with her. And As an actor, I've done Shakespeare, but I haven't directed Shakespeare in a professional professional way, I've had some opportunities. So I guess in my fantasy, yeah, let's pick a really easy show, Hamlet. Uh, it's just a, it's just something something I've always in my head thinking, yeah, I, w I would like to do that. I'm not doing it in New York. I'll go to a regional theater someplace and do a production, just mainly because that's what I worked on with her. I just fell in love with it and her. And so that'd be something I'd like to try to do. Dan? Um, Brecht, uh, uh, Galileo, or Caucasian Chalk Circle. Um, Galileo is actually where uh, Craig Lucas is doing um, an adaptation of that now for Manhattan Theatre Club, so hopefully we'll be able to put that on. And Caucasian Chalk Circle, just because I just love the play so much, and uh, was in a very early production of it. Charlie Weber, uh, who was Brecht's assistant uh, when he first came over to this country, did a production at the Actors Workshop in, I guess, 60. 263 that I was in, and um, I've always wanted to get back to it and, and sort of re-explore it. Are there ways for you to work to see that you can do these productions you want to do? Do you have to go out and instigate things? Well, I think that a, 
huge percentage of directing is initiating projects. And I think when, I, and because I'm around young young directors a lot since I teach, I actually think when a director uh, is out of work, they're not a director. Do you know that that part of directing is getting things done? So part of directing is producing. So you have to, you have to make things happen. And I think you talk them into existence. You actually uh, find your enthusiasm for them. And the etymology of the word enthusiasm means to be filled with God, to be filled with a love of it. And that enthusiasm and the ability to articulate your enthusiasm finds uh, circumstances for one. And I think it's your, jo mm -hmm. your job to actually connect and speak. Dan, do you work, I mean, you, as the acting artistic director of Manhattan Theatre Club, did you have the opportunity to say, well, yeah, I'll, I'll cover the season, but I want to do this play? Well, I mean, there aren't a lot of uh, uh, institutions uh, coming to you to say, let's do Brecht, come yeah, on. <laughs> there are just not a lot of them out there. Uh, uh, so that's something that you definitely have to um, uh, promote. Uh, and then there are just, I mean, there are not a lot of people coming to, say, uh, to you to say, let's do Pinter either. You know, I was, uh, I was shocked when Jeffrey Richards suggested the homecoming. Uh, um, and I thought, wow, yeah, that's quite amazing that you actually want to try to do this. Uh, um, it's not the usual Broadway fair, certainly. Uh, uh, hasn't been tried for a long time. So those, you know, to me, those are uh, sort of spectacular ideas. Uh, um, that in that case was is engendered by a producer, not a director. Mm -hmm. I think that you, if you get lucky sometimes that people bring you something that you actually can get passionate about or go, oh, I, that's what I want to do. But I'm just f flipping over and I'm thinking, uh, certainly 75% of what I've done is stuff that I've gone after and mm -hmm. said, this is what mm -hmm. I like to do. I'd like to try to do this or bring that. So I still feel most of it is finding things that you become passionate about and looking around and saying, can we, can we get this done? Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to let that be the last word. <laughs> thank you all for the great productions that you bring us and for bringing with us today. And thank you for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theater Wing, I'm Howard Sherman, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theater. The American Theater Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. We stand for excellence and we support education in the theater. Best known for creating the Tony Award, our work reaches beyond Broadway and New York. These seminar programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are an unequaled form for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth interviews are heard on XM Satellite Radio. Our grant and scholarship programs support New York theater companies and theater students. And since we began, we have given away more than two and a half million dollars. Our theater intern group helps young people who are just starting in their careers build a professional network. And Springboard NYC is a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org.